connections were all just planted phony evidence by the mafia, as we now know. So JFK was told, you got to cancel. Look, you, the tallest building in Tampa is right on your motorcade route. You've got to take a hard left turn just one short block away from it. It's, 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 there's 190 unguarded windows. They all open. The hotel's packed with journalists and tourists. Somebody could just sit back in one of those windows with a gun. You know, and when you make that hard left turn, your, car, your limb almost comes to a stop. You know, we can't protect you. You should just cancel. But JFK couldn't cancel for two reasons. One, he had just done that three weeks earlier, and they'd managed to keep a lid on it and keep it out of the press. If he tried to pull that again and cancel it, you know, that word is going to leak. The other reason was that speech he had to give that night in Miami. This is four days before Dallas. Commander Almeida had already gotten the $50,000 down payment on the $500,000 total. And by the way, you have to multiply all those figures by six to get what that was really worth back then. And uh, Commander Almeida's wife and two sons were out of Cuba on a apparently medical pretext, not defecting, but apparently they had to leave Cuba for some medical treatment, so they were safely out of Cuba. E. Howard Hunt helped with that and the payment. And by the way, today, Commander Almeida's two sons are successful businessmen in Madrid and in Mexico, probably with money they got over the years, as you will hear from, uh, from this operation from the CIA. So, um, so JFK had to give it, but, but even with that, Commander Almeida wanted more reassurance. So he, he wanted JFK's personal assurance from JFK's lips that he would back this coup. So JFK worked with the CIA to come up with a couple of lines to bury in this speech that JFK would give in Miami, promising to support the coup. And so JFK knew he had to give the speech in that night, so Commander Almeida would risk his life to stage the coup. So how would it look if JFK canceled his motorcade because he was afraid for his life? Well, you couldn't you know, ask somebody else to risk their life if you're not really. So Jackie was not with JFK, so JFK went ahead with that Tampa motorcade, didn't realize Traficanti, the godfather of Tampa, had found out he had been tipped off by his man on the Tampa police, Sergeant Jack de la Lana, whom we name in the book for the first time because he died a couple of years ago, and I promised I wouldn't name him until he was dead. So he's dead now. Uh, so Traficanti had found out the Secret Service knew, called off the attempt. JFK didn't know that. So he went through the motorcade. People said, well, he was in public. He looked like the JFK we see in the movies and the newsreels. Backstage, he was drawn and, sh and shaken and nervous and because, you know, JFK just knew. You know, the next time he walked out from the front of the curtain or got in that limo, he was going to be shot. But he wasn't, and it was kept out of the press completely for the next five days. So we come to Dallas. There is no active threat in Dallas. Ten, the coup is 10 days away. Harry Williams, the Kennedy's man, is meeting with E. Howard Hunt and Richard Helms in Washington, the last meeting before Harry, Harry Williams goes to Miami, then Guantanamo, then into Cuba to meet with Almeida and await the coup. Uh, and uh, there's no active threat that JFK knows of in Dallas. Jackie's with him. All the stuff you've heard about dumping LBJ from the ticket, not true. I mean, that's why JFK was in Dallas in a motorcade with Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> if he was going to dump Lyndon Johnson, boy, what a slap in the face of the people of Texas to, to go ride in the motorcade and, and be photographed in every major city with Lyndon Johnson. So that, that wasn't going to happen. So, um, so JFK thought we're home free. Just 10 days, you know, no active threat like Chicago and Tampa. Secret Service because they didn't have to deal with a threat like with Chicago and Tampa. They went out drinking until 5 in the morning at, at the friend of, a, uh, of Jack Ruby's bar in Fort Worth. So, um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap up quickly here. So, so in any event, everybody had their guard down in Dallas because there was not an active threat as there had been in Chicago and Tampa. But again, those have been kept completely out of the press so no, you know, vast majority of the American public and the news media knew nothing about it. Even most officials didn't know anything about it. So Bobby hears his brother's been killed exactly the way Bobby thought Fidel would be killed. Bobby asked the CIA director, did you kill my brother? Um, Bobby's talking to Harry Williams by phone a few hours later. And uh, Harry Williams and another far right-wing Cuban exile named Manuel Artemi had been working on the coup. Uh, Manuel Artemi, unknown to Harry Williams and unknown to Bobby Kennedy, 
was also working for the mafia, for Traficanti. And, uh, and, and, and a guy writing a book with Harry Williams and Artemi was Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Haynes Johnson, who happened to be in the room with Harry Williams right then, a few hours after JFK was shot. And so Bobby hears uh, that Haynes Johnson, who's writing the book with Artemi and Harry Williams, is, is in the room. And Bobby says, let me speak to Haynes Johnson. And, and Harry and Artemi, by the way, had started to have problems because Artemi basically wanted to be the dictator of Cuba and Harry wanted democracy. You know, it's a big, big difference there. But E. Howard Hunt was our Timmy's best friend, and, and you had to have some conservative in the government. So that's why the Kennedys put up with this guy, Manuel Artemi. But there was a lot of friction between Harry and Artemi. And, and neither the Kennedys nor Harry knew about Artemi and the Mafia. So Haynes Johnson's working on this book with Artemi and Harry Williams about the Bay of Pigs. So Bobby calls, talks to Harry. Harry says, Haynes Johnson's here. Bobby says, let me speak to Haynes. Harry hands the phones to Haynes Johnson. Haynes has written and says, Bobby Kennedy came on the line and told me, told Haynes Johnson, one of your guys did it. Told that to Haynes Johnson working on the book with Manuel Artemi. You know, and, and I think, you know, Bobby said that because, you know, the plan that Bobby knew Artemi was working on had just been used against his own brother. Now, I want to make it clear, Haynes Johnson didn't know about the coup plan because we asked him, we asked Harry, we asked other people. So Haynes didn't know what was, he didn't know why Bobby was saying that or what was up with Manuel Artemi or who Bobby was referring to. But as we explain in the book, that's who it was. So to, 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 to start to wrap up and make a long story short, there was a lot of cover-ups that began after JFK was killed, not to protect the people that killed JFK, but to prevent World War III and to protect Commander Almeida in Cuba. At the autopsy that night, it's Bobby Kennedy who's controlling the autopsy from the family suite on the 17th floor. JFK's personal physician, Admiral Berkeley, is in the autopsy room. I've talked to the guy who was their intermediary. And it's Bobby Kennedy that winds up with the crucial evidence that could show the direction of the shots like JFK's brain. That's reburied with JFK later on, as we describe in the book. So Bobby Kennedy was a prime architect of the cover-up, which had begun, as I'd said earlier, before JFK was killed, it had begun with Chicago and with Tampa. Now, so there were a lot of, and so poor Bobby Kennedy had to go along, you know, had to actually work with people like Lyndon Johnson, whom he hated, and J. Edgar Hoover, whom he hated, and they all had to cover up to prevent World War III and to protect Commander Almeida because Almeida was not exposed at that time, not a year later, not 10 years later, not 20 years later. Commander Almeida wasn't, Fidel didn't find out until 1990. Fidel arrested Che Guevara the day before the coup was supposed to happen. So, so Almeida skated for decades. Now, Richard Helms, though, he had a lot to cover up on his own, his unauthorized use of the mafia. J. Edgar Hoover had that warning from, about Carlos Marcello killing JFK. He hadn't acted on it that it happened. That warning was a year old. I mean, I... You know, I mean that, and there were a lot of mafioso complaining about JFK. So I, I can't put that too much. But Hoover had something else to cover up. A racist named Joseph Miltier from Georgia had been caught on Miami police informant tape uh, uh, several days before Tampa, saying that JFK would be shot from a building with a high-powered rifle. Okay, this is several days before Tampa. So Hoover orders a Georgia FBI agent to go investigate Miltier. Not to talk to him, but just go investigate. Miltier was from a little town in South Georgia called Quitman. And I've talked to the FBI agent, Donald Adams. Went down, investigated, kind of snuck into Miltier's place, and you know, talked to local law enforcement, and, and actually you know, bumped into Miltier on the street. But Hoover had, had ordered that the FBI agent investigating Miltier before jail.